Hello and welcome to Open Office Hours Coding for May 25th, 2012. I'm going to be here and so will Gavin. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you were so overly exuberant, I thought I needed to balance it out <laughs> by having your normal level of excitement. Alrighty, I'm going to go ahead and fire up Visual C++ 2010 Express and open up a new project. And we're going to be talking about one of the questions that just came in about dangling pointers. Dangling... Wow, wow. <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted that. Mm, carry on. What? <laughs> yes. Um, think, think, example time, example time. What am I trying to do? Uh, let's do a... Dangle a pointer. <laughs> well, I'm working on it, but I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to think of a better example. So we have a product. Gavin, name the name of another structure I could put up. That isn't person. Car. Hmm. <laughs> Mod and maple. Can anybody guess the output of this program? Go. I'm going to make sure it compiles first. I've never done this before. Because it's obviously an error, but it's a expressing the error a little bit. Guess, 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 guess. Anybody have guesses? Come on, read the code. Yes, welcome to Nelson's traditional teaching style. Just guess what it does. Read it. Ugh. What we have here is a dangling pointer. An example of a dangling pointer. Now, a dangling pointer is one of two things. A dangling pointer is either you have a pointer to memory that has been deallocated, or you have a pointer to memory that has been allocated for a different purpose. So as you notice right now, the stack frame of main is going to contain a product object and it's going to be equal to a, a product structure with the name property set to product one, or more appropriately, the name field set to product one. The next thing we do on line 20 is we create a car pointer called car and we assign it to, now this is important, I get the address of product, and then I cast the address of product to a car pointer. And then I attempt to use the car pointer as if it were a car. The result is that this car pointer now points to data that wasn't allocated specifically for the purpose of a car. Meaning, if I were to do this, for example, I would get undefined behavior. And as you notice, I just get garbage. So what's going on here is this is a dangling pointer because it's pointing to data that is not appropriate for the type that we are accessing it from. Another example of a dangling pointer may be a situation where you return a pointer for an object on the stack. So for example, if I have a function called get product, I create a product on the stack And then I return the address to a product on the stack. Now watch what happens when I do this. Okay. Who can guess the output of this program? Besides Segfault or Gavin. You mean who can correctly guess? 
I do want to point out that I'm taking advantage of a of a very specific set of circumstances. Typically the output of this program would be undefined. However, fortunately for demonstration purposes, we will see something very interesting happen. Remember though that I'm creating a product pointer P2 and assigning it to an invocation of the get product function, providing product2 as a string into the name parameter. The name parameter is used to set the name of the product and to return the address of that product to set the name for. Now if I were to run this program, what we're going to get is something, ah, it didn't work this time. Um, let me try it with a, um, let me try it with an integer. So I'm going to take the name off of our product and I'm going to work with an int. Remember, the output of this program is undefined. So I'm not surprised that I got a, a memory, a memory uh, error in that case. But I do just want to do this for demonstration purposes and want to see it do what I want it to. Yep. Okay, so what's going on here is that we are returning a dangling pointer. Remember that every bit of memory allocated onto the stack for a function, every time a function, function is invoked, we allocate a stack frame and every bit of memory that that function needs to work is allocated along with it on that stack frame. However, stack um, frames are transient. Yeah, uh, yeah, you've got an empty statement on line 19, by the way. It's line 19? It's... Ah, well, whatever. Um, stack frames are transient. As in stack frames, they come and they go. And when the memory is allocated for a stack frame and you return a variable that is local to a function, you return a pointer to that variable, you're returning a dangling pointer because the second, per definition, the second that that function exits, the stack frame is no longer available. So you'll notice here on lines 16 through 21, where whenever we invoke the get product function, we are allocating a stack frame with enough memory, at least enough memory, to hold a product variable. So the compiler at, run, at compile time knows that the product variable is of type product, and product is of course defined here on line 5. The compiler knows that it needs to allocate at least four bytes of information to the stack frame of get product in order to work. However, when that memory is allocated on the stack frame and the stack frame is destroyed, that memory is no longer considered valid. And you'll notice on line 20, I'm returning a pointer to a locally initialized variable, or more appropriately, just a local variable in general. This is very problematic, and it's very problematic because we are returning a bit of a, a pointer to a bit of memory that is going to immediately be deallocated. So even though it's not considered valid anymore, the value that was in memory is still there. Yes, a pointer that does not point to valid data, whether it's not valid data due to it being deallocated or used for a type that isn't compatible with the pointer type is referred to as a dangling pointer. We are referring to a bit of memory that's not to be used in the way that we're try trying to use. So you'll notice that when I say P1 and P2 and say get product, what's really funny is that if I print the address out for both of these things, you'll notice something strange. The addresses for both P1 and P2 on inside of main are pointing to the exact same bit of memory. Or are they this time? Yes, they are. But hold on, now I'm getting invalid. Oh, <laughs> can anybody guess why my code no longer prints out 200? Well, this is a good exercise. Why did, was my program printing out 200 previously, but now is not? Or to put it another way, how can you make it print out 200? And then I think you should whiteboard out the logic of what's what you want to happen, um, or rather, what's happen what's happening in this example, and then um, just to point up the difference, to it, or, or point up where it diverges from what you want to happen. All right, people are suggesting things. Uh, what's going on here is that the reason I'm no longer getting 200. Watch this. If I move this C out above 200, or above uh, that line that printed out the other things, you'll notice I get 200 now. 
The reason that matters is because when C out was invoked, it initialized a new stack frame, overriding the memory that both P1 and the P1 and P2 pointers are pointing to. So you'll notice that if I do it before, I get 200, but if I do it after, I get something that's undefined. That's because this memory al this memory address is pointing to a bit of memory that was deallocated and repurposed. Just don't do it. There's nothing wrong with returning pointers. You may return pointers, you may accept pointers as parameters. But what you return must be something that is not being allocated on the stack. 100% of the time, 100%, there's no exception because this is per definition. 100% of the time that you return a pointer to a piece of memory that is allocated on the stack frame of that very function, the result will be a dangling pointer. There is no exception to this rule because per definition, the second the function returns, the memory is now deallocated and repurposed for other uses. Yeah, the, the hard and fast rule is to never return pointers to variables that are local. Now, there is nothing wrong with having a function that accepts, for example, a product pointer There's nothing wrong with this code right here. This code is acceptable and this code is acceptable and here's why. Although we are passing in an address to a locally initialized variable on the main stack frame, we are doing so further down the stack. Meaning that main, the stack frame of main is still going to be allocated while print product is executed. Meaning that this product variable is always going to point to something valid. However, returning a pointer to a locally local variable will always cause a dangling pointer. Uh, I was a little confused about what we should and shouldn't return from functions. Yeah, just remember, never return a pointer to a locally initialized, to, to a local variable ever. That will always fail. Uh, what is the product product equals curly product one? I don't remember that syntax from class. Yeah, what's that's gonna this is gonna do is when you initialize a structure with the uh, with the equals operator followed by curlies, it's going to assign everything to the member that corresponds to the order that it was found in. So for example, by saying product my product equals curly one oh two four curly semi, what's happening is is one oh two four, the value of one oh two four is being assigned to the ID field under the product structure. Uh, can you return a pointer in general then? Yes, you're more than welcome to return a pointer, but it must be a pointer that points to memory that's not going to be deallocated when the function returns. What I mean by that is that although this is not valid, I could do this. I could say product pointer pointer or product pointer product equals new product. And then I can say product ID equals ID and then I can return product. This is valid because I'm allocating a product on the heap and I'm returning to a pointer on the heap. Remember that memory allocated on the heap is deterministically deallocated meaning it's not going to be deallocated until you explicitly tell uh, your program to deallocate that memory. Of course, that means that you are going to be in charge of that product pointer that's returned and properly deallocate it. Because for example, my program now has two memory leaks, 
both on line 33 and 34 because they're not paired with deletes. However, this is valid because I'm allocating that memory on the heap, which is not going to be automatically reclaimed when the function returns. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. Uh, da, da, da. I'm also very confused about sin.ignore and how that is working. I did enter it twice in the function just by trial and error because it was skipping user inputs. Um, well, actually, before that, when you do the pointer symbol, is that dereferencing? Yes. Uh, the pointer symbol is a dereferencing member access, meaning it works just like the normal member access, which is a dot, except for not only does it do member access, but it also does a dereferencing. Uh, but as far as your first question about sin.ignore, um, basically what happens is, is cn has a internal buffer of data. So if I say something like int input cn input, notice how I have a sin.get on line 10. If I were to run this code, however, you'll notice that it, the console window, immediately after typing in a number, immediately exits. That's because the CN input, when CN is asked or requested to retrieve a variable, such an uh, integral or floating point variable, what it's going to do is it's going to grab all of the bits that make up that valid data, and it's going to leave behind all the bits that don't make up that valid data. Meaning the new line that is inserted into the character buffer when you press the enter key is not taken by CN and it's still in the buffer. So CN still has data in the buffer, which means that on line 12, when we do cn.get, we are going to re receive the last thing that was on the buffer. And it, because there's still something in the buffer, it'll immediately return. If there's nothing in the buffer, that means that it will continue. So that's why we have to pair our sin, dot, our sin input sort of stuff with the sin.ignore. Because this sin.ignore will go ahead and ignore the extraneous input that was appended to the end of the input buffer. And once it ignores that input, there's nothing left on the buffer. And once there's nothing left on the buffer, a cn.git will trigger actual and true console input. Uh, does that make sense? All right, why did I have to use it twice? Uh, let me pull up your queued. Um, you really shouldn't have had to use it twice. Let me go ahead and make your code work on my end. See, this shouldn't work quite right because now when I see, notice how right now the reason this isn't working quite right is that line 15 is doing a cn.ignore, uh, which means it never gets to line 16. It's sitting there and waiting on line 15. So I'm only going to get to line 16 when I hit enter, which now it says enter name. So I can do product one, enter price, enter description, and then hit enter. And you'll notice that this does continue to work properly. Um, the reason you have to have this sin.ignore right here, I am guessing, is because you had previously not ignored something before invoking this function. This cn.ignore shouldn't be there because the get lines will eat the new line. So both line 16 and line 21 will eat the new line. However, line 18 will not eat the new line. Line 18 must be paired with the cn.ignore if you want to get rid of that new line. However, lines 21 and 16 do not. So that extraneous cn.ignore is kind of confusing. 
Um, the, the reason you need this on line 19 is because when you type in a number and hit enter, this is what happens. Let's say we have enter price. And then let's say we have the input to that. So if I say 1024 and hit enter, here's what gets added to the buffer. We get 1024, but we also get a new line. The C in method will grab these characters. The C in character will yank out the one, zero, the two, and the four out of the input buffer. Which means now the input buffer is going to look like this. At the end of line 24, the input buffer looks like this, which means that the next cn.get or get line is going to be eating up that and going all crazy. However, I, I would like to see your screen, but you really shouldn't need the cn.ignore on the top of your function. So let's go ahead and switch over. Uh, you shouldn't have to do it after every git line. Uh, git line should eat the new lines for you. It's only the numeric types that won't eat the new lines. Hello? Hey. Hey. So, uh, do you want me to run it or? Well, um, or for, where's... Do you want me to... Do you yeah, want me to un do yeah, if you take out line 32 and run it and see what happens. Are you still here, Gavin? Yep. Oh. Well, I wasn't even muted. <clears throat> oh, Sorry, I was, um, I'm, I've been working. <laughs> um, so am I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can, I'm allowed to work at the same time as you. But sadly, I haven't got as many screens as you, therefore. Yeah. You've had other people to talk to. Yeah. You've got Wolf. Hi, Wolf. Hello. <laughs> Sorry, everything's going really slow. No, no, it's not that. It's just uh, I'm I, I'm deep in a maths and C sharp problem that I can't get out of my head. So looking at C plus plus isn't conducive to my mental state. <laughs> enter name, enter price. See, it skips. Yep, I know it's wrong. Okay. Um, go into uh, the the code that prints out that main menu. Go into main menu, or what do you mean? The the code that prints out the menu. Uh, okay, I, I know, I'm not sure where it is. Let's see, display. No, it's, yeah, I don't know. Is this it? <laughs> uh. Sorry, I haven't messed with this in a while. I just remembered the problem. Well, first of all, jump into main. That's that's going to be the easiest way to track down this code. Okay, you see right there on line 60, you're going to want to pair that with the C and dot ignore. Online or 50, sorry, not 60. So if you do a scene dot ignore after that, that will get rid of the extraneous new line, which should fix your problem. Okay, looks like it. Yeah, those bugs are typically hard to find out because what's going on is isn't that your code in the git product for in, from input was wrong. It was that code that happened before it wasn't properly eating the new lines. Yeah, okay, but uh, all right, wait, where was that? Um, do you have to, after every no. get line? Uh, get every, line. Every, every, every get line adds a, a, a new line? Uh, it eats it. So you don't have to worry about it. Eats it. Yeah. The, uh, whenever you accept an integral value, um, it won't eat it. Whenever you do git line, it will eat it. So you don't have to worry about pairing the git lines with the cn.ignore. Oh, oh, right here, this cn, that made it, that makes a... Yep, the cn, uh, because you're, you're yanking out a, uh, um, a price, which I assume is a double or some other number type, um, and cn won't eat the new line in that case. So that's why you have to pair it with the cn.ignore. Okay, so whenever you have CN, you need to have a ignore after that? Only, uh, not, see, with a string, a string ends up with uh, uh, the, 
equivalent of a new line character that tells, which is the, well, not the direct equivalent, but it ends up with the, uh, the end of string. Um, what's it called, character? Null Terminator. That's the one, Null Terminator. And the string knows how to handle that. It knows that you don't want to see a Null Terminator in your string. If you've written hey, you want to see hey. Whereas numbers don't know what a, what, what, um, a new line is. So the buffer, that say you type 12 enter, the buffer says 12 enter. Any sort of number format comes along and goes, well, there's a 1, I know what that is. Oh, there's a 2, I know what that is. Who? what's an enter? I don't know what an enter is, I'll just leave it. So it grabs the number correctly, but leaves the enter, leaves the enter sat there in the input buffer. So then your next line that says, uh, um, whatever it says, your next t that, that, that's when you need to use the ignore because the number has left something lying around. All right, so any time you use a number in the CN, when you're entering a number like that, mm -hmm. use uh, ignore after. Nelson? Yeah. You don't want to eat that up. And it gets, it really gets tricky. We're going to have to actually sit down this and is talk the thing. a lot it's, about it. It's kind of, it's rules of thumb. Uh, yeah, we're going to have to talk I'm about it. I'm kind of giving you here. That's why I didn't want to say it was definitely just then. Oh. But that's... Yeah. A rule, okay, a it's rule more com follow. more complicated, but uh, at least I, I have a better, I have some understanding now because I was just I randomly putting. I'm going to try it on this line. Nope, I'll try it on this line. Oh, that works <laughs> great. I'll just well, you know. that, that's that's how I that's how I spent six years doing that before I discovered three D parts. Yeah, <laughs> hitting my head against a description of a language. I I did have another question. Yeah, what's up? I don't know if you. Uh, it, it was before this one, but it's on uh, homework six. So I, uh, you know, I, I'd really like if you looked at it, but I don't know. I, you know, I don't want to spoiler for anyone, so I don't. Well, are there any particular concepts that that we can yeah, go over? Yeah, it's 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 with uh, um, pointers. Like at, at first, I I didn't know how to add a new. Uh, uh, struct node, and uh, then uh, someone in the forums showed me that uh, if you make node a pointer and then name it node with lowercase and then uh, it equals new node, you can do it that way. Uh, but uh, what 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 I'm trying to do is I'm I don't know. Get, <laughs> uh, can I? Talk about it a little. I mean, I, well, yeah. I mean, I think this is. Uh, I mean, yeah. I can switch over back to you. Oh, I, so I can show it. Yeah, I, I mean, it's uh, people have had enough time, and it's yeah. the open office hours is for this sort of stuff. Okay. Um, so I mean, uh, I mean, this is this was my code before. I uh, I changed it. See, I, I just had node node, and it, uh, as the compiler uh, as was going, well, as the program was running, it was skipping this line. Like I thought maybe this would a act as a new or or something, but it, it was like, oh, we already know you have a node, so um, I wasn't changing uh, this at all. I, I I wasn't I wasn't creating a new node. I was just changing changing yeah. the values of the old node, and so that didn't work out at all. Um, and then setting its next value to its current node, and so that didn't work at all. So uh, so now I have uh, uh, it set up like like this, and is, is, is that the way you would? Yeah, uh, that's how you would instantiate a new node. Um, what the new operator is doing that there is it's reaching out to the operating system and asking the operating system for additional memory, meaning every iteration of this loop, you will end up with more memory allocated to your program. Whereas previously, if you had line 47 uncommented, that memory gets allocated when the stack frame gets pushed, meaning every time that you loop over that line 47, no new memory gets allocated. 
the new operator is how you tell in C++ how you tell the operating system to give you more things to play with. I found it weird. Uh, I don't know if I, I guess is this a difference between structs and classes? I mean, we haven't gotten into cl classes yet, so I don't know. I mean, we haven't really used the new no. keyword, have we? No, we haven't. Uh, the new keyword in C++ means dynamic memory allocation. Don't get it confused with the new keyword in C Sharp, which may or may not refer to dynamic memory allocation. So even if this was a class, would you need it to be a pointer to yes. point to new memory? Um, because the, the, the new operator doesn't return data, it doesn't return any, any real concrete data, all the new operator does is returns an address to the newly made available memory for you. It says, I just gave you X amount of bytes and it's at this address. Which means the only way to access that memory is via a pointer. Because a pointer is all about pointing from one bit of memory to another bit of memory. If you didn't have a pointer there, you would have no way to reach into the heap and alter the values of the data inside of the heap. Okay. Um then th this isn't working. Oh, no, this isn't. Uh, I don't know. Maybe both aren't working. But I, I was trying, I was thinking that, uh, you know, I was trying to set, I was trying to point, I guess it's, it's a pointer pointer, and that is confusing too. Uh, I guess it points to the address of the pointer and not the. That's uh, still a pointer. Um, the last note is, uh, I'm assuming last note is a pointer if you scroll up to the definition of it. Yeah, last node is going to be just a node pointer. That's not a pointer pointer. You're you're transferring the address from one pointer into the address for another pointer. You're saying, hey, other pointer, look at this now. That's what, what line 61 is doing. So let me read through this code. Um, you instantiate a new node. You set its value. Uh, if it's the first thing, you set the list dot first equals node. You set is first equals false. Then you set node next equals last node. Um, Line 58 is backwards, actually. Line 58 is backwards? Yeah, because what you're doing, it, you don't want to tell the node you just created that its next node is the last node. You want to tell the last node that its next node is the node you just created. Uh, you you, you, you want to... You you're, tra you're chaining the, the linked fence in the opposite direction, basically. Um, you should go to the whiteboard, Nelson, for yeah. this bit. Well, actually, before, could you could you swap around line 58? So say last node, next equals node. Verify the okay. code works. And then I'll switch over to the whiteboard and explain why that is. Because, I mean, here's where I was setting it. Or I was trying to. So I'm not sure. Alright. Anyway. The, also, the last thing you're going to want to make sure to do... Oops. No. No, you, you want to say Wait, last oh, node, oh, next. next. Yeah, last yeah. node, next node, yeah. equals node. Oops. Yep. Um, and then the last thing you're going to want to do is immediately after you instantiate your node, set its next pointer to null. So after line 46, actually that's um, blah blah blah, yeah that's, yeah, line, after line 46, set node next equals to, equal to null. This is very important because again, as, as I'll show in the diagram, this will make it so your code knows when to stop looping over the list. It'll give it a terminator. Um, it's going to be null in all caps. Oh, yeah. Do you want me to run this? or? Um, could you jump into your uh, show list method first, or function first? Because I, I just want to make sure this works. Uh, yeah, that should work. So now if you run this, uh, you're going to want to take out, yeah. Now if you run this, it should work. Cool. Okay, so what was go what's going on here is blah, blah, 
blah blah blah, where is my Photoshop? Hold on, I have to go find my tablet. <laughs> I had to move it to make room for the pizza. You've got to have priorities. Yeah. You can't eat a tablet. Well, you can if you've got a headache. <laughs> yes, you could, I suppose. Did it, did it, did it, did it. Okay. Okay, so what you're, what you're doing, really, on every iteration of that loop is you have a node pointer called last. Well, I think it was called actually last node in your, in your previous example. And then you have every iteration of the loop, though, you're going to have a node pointer called node. And you're going to new it up or instantiate it. What this code right here does is every iteration of the loop, it's going to request additional memory from the heap. So the first iteration of the loop, it's going to return this memory on the heap. The second iteration of the loop, it's going to return this memory on the heap. The third iteration of the loop, it's going to return this memory on the heap, and so on. Every time you invoke the new operator, you're going to be getting additional memory. So that's how you're able to yank out additional bits of information to store your stuff in. However, what you're going to need to do is you're going to have to point the last node. So let's say this loop has ran through three times. We have three nodes. The last, the current node object, if you remember your code, points to the newly allocated node. The node pointer points to the newly allocated node. The last node pointer points to the last allocated node. Which means that what you're going to want to do is hook up the next property of the last pointer to point to the new node. Now the next time this code executes, here's what happens. You allocate a new node by using the new operator. And this time the code looks like this where the last node equals the node that was created in the previous iteration, and the new node is the node that's created right here. So in this case, you're going to want to set the next pointer of the last node to the new node. So let's say we loop over one more time. The new operator right here creates a new node. However, during this iteration of the loop, the last pointer points to the po node created last time, and the current node pointer points to the node created this time, which means that we now have to hook up the next pointer for the last node into the new node. And that's how we get a linked list. Okay, that makes sense now. Let's see how I got it backwards. Alrighty. Hey, can, before you mute me, yeah. uh, um, it, at the end of uh, class, when everybody else get, has a chance to um, get everything, if you might be able to help me with back in uh, uh, homework three of C sharp, that would be cool. All right. Yeah, just be sure to remind us. All right. All righty. So, da da da. Okay, Chris has a monster question. So my program has an interface iUsable, which contains a use method. Let's say I have two game objects that implement both iUsable and an interface i item, a health pack that modifies the player's health and a gun that lets you shoot things, both of which need their own class to implement different versions of the use method. The issue I see is in order to save and load the game, you have to add a new entry to your enum and a new line to your load game command to interpret the new type. This seems very messy. Is there a better way to do it with what we currently know, or do you just need to use some sort of special thing that we haven't, say, reflection? Segfault's answer. 
Um, no, you, you'd be stuck with reflection. <laughs> um, the way I did it, uh, the way I did it was I, I kind of broke things out a little bit. I know people aren't required to break things out like I did, but I did break things out a little bit. Um, if I can show the code. But um, the, the answer to your question is yes. The way things are currently in, put together, we have an enum that defines the game object type. That enum is going to have to be switched on whenever we load an object into the game, period. There's no exception to that. Now the way I did it was I broke out the loading and saving of each individual game object into its own class. Now this isn't a requirement for what you guys would do or need to do. But here is an example of a way you can make things a little tiny cleaner. Bit. <laughs> wow. A little bit tiny cleaner. A little bit tiny cleaner. A little tiny bit cleaner. There we go. Words are hard. Um, so what I have is I have the concept of an iGameObject persister, which has a, a method to create a game object given a particular ID, a method to load an object, and a method to save an object. Then I have a static class called persister factory that has a case that returns a new persister depending on the game object type that was passed in. That means for me, all I have to do when I create a new game object type is I need to create a new persister, a new in entry into the enum, and then a new case statement. However, there's no way to avoid that logic. And believe me, the way that you're currently doing it with enums is significantly preferable than a way without enums. But there is no way to get it to automatically wire up without some sort of concept of reflection. And reflection is a little bit out of scope. Does that answer your question? Am I still here? Yeah. Well, I am. I don't know if you are. All right. I had some trouble deciding on best design for C sharp inventory. At uh, first, I thought of having an inventory list item as property of the room player classes, so each room player has a list of items it has. I thought of having one inventory class which holds a list of items, each item having a location property, game object set to a player room or enemy. Not sure which would be best. Any thoughts? I would not have an inventory class that points to the class that owns it. I would have the class that owns it point to that in, in, instantiation of the interface type. Um, now, what I did was, if I remember correctly, um, I have the concept of an uh, I container, and my I room implements I container. So you'll notice that the I container is a concept of um, items, getting an item, and removing an item, and adding an item. So that's what I did. So in, I have an I container for players and I rooms. Um, I would not, because basically what you're suggesting is something like this, where the inventory points to a player or it points to a room, which is backwards. A player contains an inventory. In fact, the inventory doesn't even necessarily need to know that it's being owned by a player. There's no need for it to. Unless, it, unless there is a need for it to, in which case you can't do it. But the point is, is that uh, a bidirectional relationship isn't always what you want to do. Um, uh, typically, unidirectional relationships, as you see right here on this example, where the player owns the inventory, but the inventory doesn't know it's part of a player, typically results in cleaner code, um, but is not always possible to do. However, this, this is, I would solve the problem by doing the opposite of what you suggested, where the room owns an inventory, and the player owns an inventory. Not that the inventory owns a player, the inventory owns a room.
Uh, did, uh, can you return a pointer in general? Yes, if it's dynamically instantiated. Uh, not sure if you answered this, but on C-sharp homework, did you want the objective of the game to be tracked? No. That wasn't a requirement, but you're more than welcome to uh, throw that logic in there. Um, A problem with this in the homework previously, I stored a user input into character because it was A, B, or C, D input. The next time I prompt them for more input later, but it would just skip that input automatically and so I would see in dot get for asking them for input. Uh, well, he left and I think I already answered that. <laughs> There's a dis distinct lack of red flags on the questions panel, Gavin. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't think you looked at them. I started to, and then you, I started relying on you, then you just took it away. Well, you know, if you're going to talk about C++, plus, plus, well, I'm... <laughs> I'm fighting with Unity at the moment, and I'm hating it. It's so... Oh, uh, uh, okay. Uh, is there a way to know you have a memory leak, like a debug window, where you can see what's on the heap? There is no way to exactly see what's on the heap. But there is a very sneaky way to detect memory leaks in your application. I'm sure that there is a, not a built-in way, but I'm sure there's a third-party library that will do this for you. But it is possible inside of C++ to overload the new, and actually, I can just show you how you how you would implement this. I mean, well, let me see if there's any other questions. Then I'll then I'll go back to that, Daniel. Uh, I actually did this this way, but wasn't sure if it was correct. Yes, that that would be correct. Okay, so now back to Daniel's question because this is going to be fun. Now we can lever leverage people's understanding of linked lists, as well as a methodology for detecting. Uh, um, memory leaks. However, I don't, I, don't, I don't expect people to be able to implement what I'm about to show because it's going to involve um, the new and delete operator overloading. But this will be a fun little thing to talk about, or at least a methodology for detecting um, memory leaks. Basically, the new operator and the delete operator are overwritable. The new operator at the end of the day, simply calls a function called M-A-L-L-O-C, and the delete operator simply invokes a function called F-R-E-E. -E. So malloc and free are the corresponding new and delete. New and delete are just operators that are more or less, but not necessarily, but more or less, simply wrappers around the malloc and free method functions. Malloc and, and free of course that's is from C. Malloc being M alloc for yeah, memory, memory alloc. allocate. But I said we can override the new and delete. What if we did this? What if we had, let's say, new, and somebody said, I want a new thing that's 10, 15 bytes, right? So check this out. What if we did this? Wow, that's really bad. What if, uh, to the, is new a wrapper or is malloc a wrapper for new? Uh, new is a wrapper for malloc. Um, if we overload the new operator, we can, instead of just turning around and saying, okay, the user asked for 15 bytes of data, derp, derp, I'm going to go ahead and call malloc with 15 bytes of data. Instead of doing that, what if we did this? What if we, this was horribly written out code, so I'm going to go ahead and delete it um, and get this on my right setting. There you go. Oh, that says 15 plus. I thought it said first. It meant 15 plus. <laughs> I suddenly tweaked. What if... To be honest, I read, I read that as new is. It was... Ugh. What if, instead of simply being dumb and invoking malloc, 
um, with exactly how much, many bytes it asked you for. What if you did this? You invoked malloc, but you added a little bit of extra memory at the top. Now, when you return, you return a pointer to the memory that was asked for. So let's say you invoked new with 20. This bit would be 20 bytes long. But we can have a little bit of space on top, a little secret compartment that we can attach onto every bit of memory allocated in the new op with the new operator by overloading it. Guess what we can stick into that little compartment? Can anybody guess what we can stick into an additional compartment by allocating, I'll give you a hint, four bytes of additional memory every time a dynamic memory allocation happens? Okay, a pointer, but a pointer to what? Let's say we invoke new again. We invoke new and we ask for 50 bytes. What do we get? Well, we get our nice little 50 bytes allocated for us uh, via the malloc function. So we get 50 bytes. And we have our nice little compartment up here. And then we return a pointer not, to the not directly to the memory we allocated, but to the memory that was asked for. What we can do now is we can link the memory that was allocated before to the memory that is allocated now. We have hidden in a little secret compartment into every instantiation a linked list that points to all allocated memory on the heap. Now, I didn't actually mean to say four bytes here. Um, I should have said eight bytes, and here's why. We need a doubly linked list. The reason we need a doubly linked list is when the delete function happens, so when delete hap when the delete operator happens, we say we want to delete this memory. And remember, the memory that's going to be deleted is going to point to the bit that was actually asked for. If we use pointer arithmetic to jump all the way back into our secret compartment, we can grab the previous node and we can delete it off the linked list. Meaning, with the delete operator, by overloading the delete operator, we can remove that chunk, that secret compartment, off of our linked list. Which means at the end of a program, all we need to do is have a pointer to the first node that was allocated dynamically. And we can walk that node and then we can figure out how many objects were leaked during execution of our program. Cool. I mean, how's everyone feeling about that? that Friday feeling. Yeah. I'm just going to go ahead and implement this for fun, but I forgot the exact syntax of the um, I forgot the exact syntax of the thing. I haven't done this for many years. Look in the questions panel at the bottom. Uh, da -da, blah, blah, blah. Sorry, my question was answered. I'll have to be AFK shortly. Uh, yes, I did answer your question, hopefully. Uh, 
Uh, is MongoDB any good? Never used it. Well, let's try this out and see how well this is going to work. Because again, just kill some time waiting for some questions to come up. Might as well show you guys something cool. Oh, you don't have to understand this, obviously. This is just some fun stuff. This is the kind of stuff I like doing. Okay. That translates into English as run for cover. Your mind is about to fall out of your ear. I don't know what the pat operator is supposed to do. So let me go ahead and just... Let me just see it out and see what happens. The pat operator. A uh, pat parameter. NATO there will always be more pony. Um... forget the syntax. It's so cool. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Well, I know it's conflicting with the actual new operator, but I know there's a way to globally do this. I've done it before. Void operator new. According to what I'm reading, this is supposed to work. I just had to do a corresponding delete. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and implement a very simple memory leak detection program. So I'm going to say struct memory header, and I'm going to say memory header prev memory header next. And then I'm going to create a global uh, memory header first. In fact, I'm just going to stick this inside of another source file. I'm going to call this memory. And I'm going to do this up here. Um, we're going to need a reference to the C standard library to get malloc and free. So include CSTD lib. OK, so and then I'm going to wrap, of course, this into an anonymous namespace. So the f during new, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say um, memory header pointer header equals malloc n plus size of memory header. And then when I return, oh, I have to do a hard cast on it because, uh, yeah, there we go. And then when I return, I'm going to return header plus size of memory header. Now when I delete, I'm going to say free p minus size of memory header. Um, there you go. Okay, so as of right now, I shouldn't, this code should work just fine although it's not doing anything yet. Notice I don't get any exceptions. Let me go ahead and include a delete P in here. Oh, we do get an exception. Uh, blah, 
blah, blah, blah, blah, blah, blah, blah. Free. That's weird because P should be the product. So I should be able to say P minus size of memory header, which should um, get rid of that additional header. So let's see. Keep Alec. Who's Malicking? Sounds like a ruler of Persia from about the 12th century. <laughs> Malicking! The Magnificent. Malik. Hi. I'm not helping, am I, Dad? see here. I haven't done this in so long. Void operator, because we're doing it the first time properly, and then the second time properly, and then we get an exception. Now we're getting exception during freeing, um, because the header doesn't like, doesn't like it at all. <laughs> um, I know I'm getting my casts wrong somehow. Pointer arithmetic with actual byte size. That's typically what you do. Um, unless I'm wrong about something. If I do minus minus on memory header, character pointer p minus size of memory header, and then I need to free the header. Okay, so this should run without exceptions if it could compile. Um, this should run without exceptions, and it does. Okay, that's the first step. The next step is I need to go ahead and create my linked list. So I'm going to, first of all, initialize my first node to null. Once I allocate something, though, I'm going to say um, if first equals null, then first equals header. Um, I'm also going to want to have a pointer to last and set that to null. So if first equals null, first equals, first equals last equals header. Otherwise, I want to link it in a different way. I want to say last um, next equals header, last equals header, um, header dot prev equals last, and then last equals header. Um, header prev, and then of course I want to do header dot next equals null. So deleting is going to be a little bit trickier. I'm going to have to do, I'm going to have to grab the memory pointer and I'm going to have to say 
header dot prev next equals header next, and then header next prev equals header prev. Now that should remove it from the linked list. So finally, what I can do is I can write a method called void report memory leak leaks, and I can say uh, memory header node equals first, while node does not equal null, node equals uh, node next, see out of blah, 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 blah. Alrighty, so the next, oh right, because I need to make sure that uh, if header prev does not equal null, do this. If header next does not equal null, do that. Now when I run this code, I shouldn't get any memory leak. Oh, come on. Header prev never got assigned to null, which I never did because first last equals header, header dot next equals header prev equals null. Okay, so now let's go ahead and report some memory leaks, which means I'm gonna have to include a header file. Um, called memory. So now if I report memory leaks before doing the delete, and then after, we should see an access violation. Which, by the way, wasn't what I wanted. Uh, this is happening at the end. So the first time we do it, we get properly memory leak of 32 bytes, memory leak of 8 bytes, which is what we want. And then after we delete P and we report the memory leaks, uh, the problem is first is never assigned to null in the case that we have deleted all the memory that we started. So now I can say if header equals first first equals null, if header equals last, last equals null. Awesome. So now we have just effectively made it so we can report memory leaks. So you'll notice the first time we ask for memory leaks, we get a memory leak of 32 bytes and then a memory leak of 8 bytes. Now, the 8 bytes is actually coming from dynamically allocated memory inside of the string. So you'll notice that if I add in another string called like description, we'll get a third entry there because we have three, um, we have two strings being allocated. But then you'll notice when we run our report memory leaks again, we get zero because we have properly deallocated that and made the linked list empty, essentially. So there's a lot of fun stuff you can do with that. So we, so did this answer your question at least as far as finding memory leaks? It's definitely fun stuff. You can abuse C++ to a massive extent and have a whole lot of fun um, doing crazy stuff with it. 
Uh, can you use this to make a garbage collector? No, I wouldn't use, you can't use this to make a garbage collector. A garbage collector needs to walk on all the references, um, which isn't going to be possible to do, unfortunately. Okay, um, I have an OOP question. I'm basically trying to see if a class writes to a database via actions. Should have a separate class for its actions, a class itself be its properties. More info in the gist. An event has an ID name and other data that goes in the database. Actions need to be performed. They get passed in the database. Ooh. Here's my answer to that. Database access to relational databases is a solved problem as far as I'm concerned. Um, be just the tiniest bit more explicit about what the hell you mean. No. Uh, and Hibernate is a object relational mapper, meaning it's a library that will automatically generate SQL for you for querying and for inserting and for deleting and for updating entities. It's very mature, industry standard, and rock solid. Um, I highly recommend and Hibernate for any database access. Now, if you wanted to go a little bit crazy, you could work with some of the micro ORMs that are coming out these days. Um, uh, da -da -da. Uh, Dapper, these are like the three main ones. Um, Massive, for example, which is funny because Massive is a single CS file that is 673 Massive. lines long. <laughs> it's a very small file. Um, and apparently it's better than chocolate. Um, this is the kind of stuff you'd be using for, if you wanted to go really, really, really close to the SQL, you would use something like a micro ORM. Um, Petapoco apparently is the fastest from what I understand. Um, but anyway, that's typically what you would do, but I would highly recommend using a proper ORM. Which, and by the way, and Hibernate works with, uh, with PostGray, MSSQL, SQL, Oracle, SQLite, MySQL, um, and probably a bunch of others too. Uh, we have a special database access layer to call numeric values that call specific st stored procedures. Well, that there's your problem. <laughs> um, now, if you really need to continue to use stored procedures, your best bet's probably in micro ORM. Now you can coax and hibernate to work with stored procedures, but it's not going to be very pretty. Um, I would use a, um, a micro ORM if I was forced to work with uh, stored procs, and uh, probably not massive, because mass, I mean, uh, I've... It's more geared towards like read model sort of stuff. I would take a look at Petapoco. And as far as where I would put that code, the code for loading and saving of things should really go in the corresponding repositories. Uh, you should create like a event repository class uh, coupled with an event repository interface and then load and save it to that. The actual event object, if it has domain logic within it, it should remain there. However, the repository should be responsible for saving and loading it to whatever storage mechanism you're using. However, stored procedures are, I mean, I would, yeah. I mean, uh, why do they exist? They exist to torment me. Uh, yeah, I would um, 
put it in a repository. As far as your DAO, um, I mean, really, Petapoco and Nhibernate are DAOs, if you think about it. Um, they truly are database, uh, they, they fit every thing that, of what a DAO is. But if you have your custom DAO and you need to have some additional logic for storing and saving stuff, then pull it out into another layer for a repository. Your repository will depend on your DAO to uh, modify and insert your data. Uh, I'm behind the lessons for C++. I would like to know how I can move my, have my homework get checked. I'm not looking for a certificate. Uh, talk, that's a Gav question. Well, we were talking about this earlier. That's why I mentioned it earlier. Is that the guy who sent me a PM about it? Oh. Hang on, I'm closing windows. But uh, essentially, um, no, not really. <laughs> There's only two weeks of homework to go. Um, uh, and keeping track of all the homeworks from everyone in all the classes is hard enough week by week without then trying to fit in marking five preceding weeks homework. Um, but all of what <clears throat> all of what the homeworks all uh, Nelson goes through afterwards in each of the videos like the preceding homeworks and like he has been doing tonight in the so you can see how Nelson would do it, but um, this late in the course, it's really not, um, it's just creating more work, really, um, without, uh, and the other, I mean, the other thing is these courses aren't one-offs, so they are going to be coming around again, and, uh, yeah. Nelson, hello? Yeah. I agree with whatever you said. Stop reading your pony book. <sighs> Not reading the pony book. I want to show something, someone cool. Some, I don't know. Oh, check this out. While you're typing, Michael Cameron. Oh, he's left. I was going to ask him about his curvy things. Oh, come on. I know you can do this. What is it you're trying to do? Magic. Well, you know, it never works. Oh, come on. I know... No, no instance of Oprah matches the argument list. I wonder if I have to... Um, yeah, I probably have to forward declare my uh, custom new method now. Custom new function. Redefinition. Shouldn't have to externalize it. I don't think I should need a ma matching delete. Um, it should really just work. Let me see what happens if I bring all of this code into main.cpp. Uh, nope. Uh, well, of course, that's not going to work because I moved my using up here. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Nope. Because I know, I know for a fact that you can pass in parameters into the new. Well, then you fix Segfault it. Segfault points out you are failing, Nelson. Well, fix it, Segfault. Well, given this is just you playing. Well, 
Well, apparently I'm the teacher. When did that happen? Yeah. yeah. Ooh, I know what I did wrong. <laughs> no, I didn't do that wrong. That's actually right. <laughs> I'm going to actually, I'm going to go ahead and pause. We did get a question. We did have, um, I we have one more question coming. Um, blah, da, da, da. I had a question about move room command, but I just succeeded to make it work. Should I create a new item inside of GameFactory.cs with GUID? Should I use the use on item.cs or player.cs? Um, I don't know. I don't understand the question. Well, that's because you read, didn't read out what he said. He said, should he place the use on item.cs or player.cs? Um, I would place it on the item. I mean, it really depends. Uh, you would possibly get more flexibility if you placed it on the player type itself, as in... Um, I was wondering, yeah, kind of depends on factors sort of in the rest of your program, doesn't it? Because you can come at it but from both directions. Mm -hmm. You would either have player.use passing in the item to be used, or, item, or you would have yeah. player.item.use, or inventory.item. As far as what needs uh, GUIDs, every game object needs a GUID. Otherwise, there's no way to uniquely identify the objects. So all items need a unique ID. Everything in the game is a game object. And that's actually an architectural decision I made up front. I did not want to have the game be constructed... Uh, well, think about it this way. If you're in UDK, for example, when you place a game object onto the scene, you're pretty much doing this. You're instantiating an object, giving it an ID, and placing it into the scene. What this create game method is doing is essentially performing the operations that a level editor would do. At the time of runtime, however, because every object is persisted uniquely, you get the benefit of being able to persist things that you wouldn't normally. So for example, you could have rooms, and you can add and remove connections between those rooms at runtime, and those new connections would be persisted. As opposed to your game map being something that's static, it is now something that's completely dynamic and gives you a considerable more amount of flexibility. Each individual item can be altered during the runtime of your program and can save its state. Meaning that, for example, you can implement a key um, that decays because the key cannot keep track of its state as it's running through your program. And that state is persisted. Uh, why would you use GUID.parse instead of GUID new GUID? I was thinking more in terms, when I, when I d made that decision, I was thinking more in terms of um, what would actually happen if I had a level editor. If I actually had a level editor, what I would do, or what would happen is what you see right here. The level editor would assign a new GUID and place the game object into the world. Um, however, it doesn't make any difference. It makes absolutely no difference. It was just, for me, it felt like it made more sense to do it statically. Um, because that would mimic what would happen given you were actually working within a level editor. And yes, anyone who didn't get NATO's reference will fail the course. Well, I'm teaching it and I didn't get, a, get it. Get really? It. Grog? Grog. There we go, Sakeful got it. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, I guess we're about done. So, Wolf, did you still have uh, questions you wanted to switch over for? Because I don't see any more questions in the questions panel, and it's been about an hour. Alrighty. I've just flagged up Wolf's thing. Uh, da -da. But actually, that yeah, doesn't say anything. Well, we can do with unmuting him, probably. There we go. Uh, hello. Hello. Hey. Hey. Uh. All right. I'm. <laughs> you know, like I said, it's been a, a while since I've looked at this, and I kind of lost track of what I was doing, and like, uh, I don't think I have a. I can't, I was just looking, I can't see one in your Solution Explorer. Game Factory, so I think, I think whatever I was doing, I gotta remember what a Game Factory is supposed to do, but whatever I was doing, I was gonna do, I was putting it here and then I was gonna implement it, but I don't even, I, I'm sure I probably got this from some code you did, you know, so, but, yeah, uh, I don't know, I just thought maybe you could point me back in the right direction and get my head around it. Yeah, I can switch over to, uh, let me switch back to me. If, if I jump into the implementation of my start game command, I say engine.begin game, and then I do game factory.create game. Imagine this is simply loading in a level that you've created already. That's all it's doing. Except for we don't have a level editor with this application, so we're not loading it from anywhere. I'm simply statically creating all of the game objects. So my create game method, when you start a new game, it instantiates a game. It instantiates all of the items, instantiates all of the containers, all of the rooms. Then it links up all of the rooms, or well, it instantiates my room requirements. Uh, then it links up all of the rooms. So there's my game map. Um, adds all the items to the rooms. Uh, adds all the items to the proper containers. And then it returns a new game. It returns the game out of it. That's all it does. Is it instantiates a game, set, sets up a bunch of game objects, and returns it. That's it. This is basically where you would load from a level that you would create in a level editor. Except for in this case, it's all static code um, because we don't really have a level editor. Okay, so this is you put your rooms and. Yep. So all this is is a single public class that should in itself be static because it only has one member, which is a public static game create game. And I moved it out into its own its own class because um, to make the code cleaner. So you create the game and you create the rooms? Mm -hmm. I create the game, and, I create the items, create the rooms, I link up all the rooms, and then I return the you create the player game. in there? Yes, I also instantiate the player. It links the rooms as well, okay. So that just kind of has all the... Well, it's a game factory. It, it builds the game. Yep. It, it, that, that, that there is the game. That is the log game logic that says this room's connected to this room and this room's got a giraffe in it and the player's over here and he'll die if he eats a fish. This is... This is... Hmm. You're supposed to name... You name the game, or you give it the player's name. You give it. I give it the player's name. Actually, I don't know if I even use the player name anymore. Uh, I think I give. I think I instantiate the player with the player name. Actually, is what I do. Oh, hey, look, my um, Visual Studio is starting to crash. Raw. Ooh. This is what I like doing. I like staring at frozen exactly. Visual Studio all day, every day. It's my favorite. Nope, there we go. Yeah, I uh, set the player's name to player name. We did have another question about your version of the game, Nelson. Uh, did, uh, what have you done to encapsulate console output for your version of the game? I did something... Now, I it pained me to do it like this, but it was the only way I could do it in a way that I could explain during the course of this class. I'm not going to go over exactly the details of how this works, but... What I ended up doing was abusing the iDisposable um, interface. So if you look at the main menu, actually the main menu is a bad example. If you look at the room state, you'll notice I 
instantiate a new co console colors. And then I have an output class. The output class has a method called write full line in it. The write full line method will, well, write a full line out so that if you have a special background color, that background color gets repeated across the entire line. Um, I also have a, a static class called text with a word wrap implementation that I stole from the internet. Um, somewhere from Stack Overflow, I think. And Did you steal, I thought you stole that from um, from Hyperion. No. Or rather, I assumed you stole that from Hyperion. Nope. And hmm. so you'll notice that I use it in the case like line text word wrap room description, which gives me a uh, display similar to this. It, well, it is a very primitive setup. I mean, it works, and it's stuff that we will be eventually talking about. It's not that primitive a setup. It's definitely a 102 setup. Yeah. See, if you hadn't used such weird command names. I was like, where did my inventory code go? Huh. I could have sworn I had an inventory state. Uh, what about the room state? What is that doing? The room state, every state has two responsibilities. To print out the user in interface of the game, of that current state, so I print out the room, and also to parse the intent of the user. So you'll notice that this code like might look a little scary, but it's really straightforward. I do really basic um, user input parsing. Uh, I didn't know how to set up getting names, getting things by names. Well, for example, you'll notice my uh, my get method. If I type in get, it says var item equals room dot get item. Room dot get item simply searches a um, uh, searches through all my items and returns an item when the name equals that other item. Now, of course, yes, I know I could do this with a first or default or preferably a singular default, but we're not using link, so I can't. Um, yeah, that's all it does. And then so it searches for the it searches the room for an item given uh, at a, for a particular name, and then it checks to see if the item isn't null. And if it isn't null, it returns a new pickup command passing in the room. So we're getting into metaphysics now. You pick up the room. That's right. It sounded like you were picking up the room. That's a good question. And we're back. Good question time. Um, da, 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 da. Oh, hold on, Nato. Okay, the split method has a special overload that will allow you to do what you want. Do you want to tell people what he wants to do? Yes. Basically, he wants to say, pick up red ball, for example. Now, if we simply had done this, var input equals console read line, and say var parts equals input dot split on um, spaces, and then if parts length equals two and parts zero equals pick up, and then I would say console write line, you are picking up blah. What is the output of this program? Yeah, what, what's the output of this program? No, Dak. It's actually not. 
the output of this program is Nothing blank. Yes. Here's why. If I go ahead and do uh, this and say uh, pick up red ball and I debug it and I look at my parts array, you'll notice it has three items in it, pick up, red, and ball, which means that parts.length equals two is not true, so therefore this if statement's never going to enter. There's a special overload into split that you're going to want to take care of or we're going to want to know about. If you look right here, this overload takes in a character array of um, separators and also a count. So if I did this, if I said new character array, pass in just a single space, and then done two, and hit F5, and now I say pick up red ball, it'll say you picked up red ball. Because now it'll only go a, up to two it, items. It is a bit counterintuitive. The two relates to the number of, the eventual number of items that you want to end up with. Yeah. Is there another syntactically slight similar? Oh, is there a syntactically different but similar way of doing it, uh, where you can just split on the first occurrence of a space? Uh, the first occurrence of a space, uh, not, that I, I not that I know of. I think that's the only way to do it. Okay. Oh, yeah, like Segfault said, you could do something like... Um, oh, yeah, that would work, yeah, substring. Well, you... First occur index, first index. Or, yeah, but that would get all messy and gross. Yeah, that would be... Ugh. Okay, pausing the video. Um, I mean, uh, the extension of the homework's up to Gav. When was it due? Uh, I think it was the 25th. Today. Oh, oh isn't today the 25th? Oh, well, today is now the 26th for me. When did that happen? But, um, uh, yes, so homework was due somewhere noon today, probably, or beginning of class. Huh. Um... Da, 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 da. When's the next class? Um, Monday for the Monday. C++ guys. Oh, that's the point. C, which homework were you on about? Stephen Edwards. C sharp. Uh, didn't you have like two weeks to do that? Or am I getting confused? I don't know. I'm confused. I'm going to go ahead and wrap up the video because people are just talking about homework now. So, goodbye, future watchers. Bye.